Good morning, River of Life. It is great to be with you again. What a day we had last Sunday as we opened up our series on the Holy Spirit. This is just a three-week series, so we need to be ready. We need to get all we can because this we could talk about the Holy Spirit for years. That's how awesome he is. And we saw a little bit with that last week as we took a look at what the Holy Spirit does in our lives prior to salvation. This week, we are going to look at what he does after we give our hearts to Jesus. And it is amazing what he does. You know, one of the questions that we proposed to you last week was this. If God has something that wonderful for us, you say, what are you talking about? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who He is, what He does. He is co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is not third on the totem pole. So we, we have this question, if he's that great, that wonderful, why in the world would we not want to investigate all that he can offer? All that he can offer. And we are going to be looking the following week at the gift of tongues. We just want to put that part on the shelf and leave it there, not realizing that the gift of the Holy Spirit, the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for the believer today. And so we want to look at all that the Holy Spirit does, everything about him, because that's what the word of God demands for us to do. In fact, in John 16, 7, Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. That word helper there, it's another name for the Holy Spirit. He is our helper. He is the counselor. We see in John 14 verse 26 again Jesus says but the helper the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you wow everything imagine that he's talking to the disciples here and he says listen I've been with you for over three years we have talked a lot. The Holy Spirit is going to resurface, bring to your attention, open your heart to all the truth that I have for you. That's amazing. But you know what? It's been my observation that we really do not understand the work of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We, we don't grasp what he does, who he is. We do know that he shows up in our services. We sense his presence. We know he enables people to be used in various gifts. We know he is the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he fills us full of the Holy Spirit. When we give our lives to Jesus, the Bible says the Spirit of God fills us, dwells in us. We looked at that last week. So we understand that, but we do not really grasp everything he does and the true impact he has on our life. And the result of that is this. We, we don't put ourselves out there as believers. We don't step out in faith. And faith is a, a scary thing. But when we avail ourselves, when we open ourselves to all that he does, all that he is, it brings us 
power. It gives us a peace that goes beyond our understanding. We then allow the Holy Spirit to be unhinged in our lives and we will do great things for the Lord because the church of the living God is alive because God is alive. He is not dead. He gave his life for us, but he rose again on the third day and we have the resurrection power of the Spirit of God living in us. He changes us. He transforms us. He delivers us. He comforts us. There is so much to him. And when we don't allow him to work, again, we put some things we don't understand on the shelves. We hold ourselves back from all that he can do. And we're mis, we, we, we misunderstand the person of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1 through 3, I want you to see what Paul says about this. And this will really set up what we are going to discuss and what we're going to talk about this morning. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. That would be like him saying, oh, oh, foolish Spotsylvanians, <laughs> or oh, 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 you guys in Fredericksburg, or you guys in, let, let's just say in, in, in America or around the world. He says, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Watch this. Having begun in the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Um, listen, church. Al although we are seeing a number of exciting things happening, not only in our area, but around the world, as the spirit of God is moving, as he is drawing people, men and women, to himself, the church by and large, especially in America, has fallen into the same trap that the Galatians fell into. What we just read, the church has bought into the idea that there is nothing that we can't do on our own. That human understanding can actually solve every problem that there is in life. That if we will just think about it hard enough, if we will just research it enough, that mankind will find the answer. That we are that powerful, that smart, that articulate, that we can handle life on our own. I believe we see the evidence of that in primarily a couple areas. First, it is the church growth movement. In the last decade, there have been an explosions of conferences and seminars that are all designed to teach us how to build the church, how to grow the church, how we are to get thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to our church. And if we just do A, B, C, and D, the church is going to grow. And what bothers me about this is we have forgotten that in the book of Acts, it says this, the Lord will build build his church. The Lord will grow his church. In fact, it says the Lord added to their number daily as people were getting saved, as they were giving their hearts to Jesus. It's God who builds the church. It's the spirit of God who, who saves people. It's the spirit of God who puts the body of Christ together. We have to remember that we cannot do it on our own human injury. We cannot, we have to remember, we cannot do it with our own human intelligence. All that we have, our own power. But yet we try so hard. We try so hard to do that. And we forget to seek after the spirit of God. It, it is a must. We must seek after the spirit of God. We cannot allow ourselves to think we can do it and do life on our own. Secondly, 
The second area, I believe we have abandoned the ability of the Spirit of God to work in the life of the believer is in this area of Christian counseling. Listen, I am not against Christian counseling. I am all for it. I love it. Yet at the same time, I fear today in the church world, we have opted for a psychological satisfaction, if you will. Whereby we believe that if you have a problem, what you need is to go see a a counselor and work it through with that counselor. And it's only, this is the key, it's only through counseling, through the efforts of people that you and I can be strengthened or transformed or changed. And the result is we have left the altar. We have left going after God prayer, reading the word, and we have left the move of the spirit behind. And in our minds, our heart of hearts, we have gone to full-fledged human efforts to try to achieve what God through the Holy Spirit can do in our lives on his own. We have tried to deal with people's inner being when really we don't understand fully our own hearts, let alone someone else. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah 17 and verse nine, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And then he says this, who can understand it? We can't even understand it. I mean, Christian counseling is valid when it does this. It tells people what the Bible says about their situation and it plugs them into the power of the Holy Spirit in order to transform hearts, to truly change a person's direction. Then you have solid Christian counseling. But without that, all you have are man-made philosophies and ideas causing people to rely on what someone says or to rely on some philosophy instead of relying on the Spirit of God to guide us, to direct us, to show us not only who He is, but show us the plan and the path that God has for us. Listen, church, this is what is also happening in pulpits or in churches all across our nation. We, we are listening to the thoughts of men. We are listening to the thoughts of women who are presenting a soft gospel. We are relying on books and, and that have a consumer gospel. And this is where we're getting our resources. We're relying on stories to energize us, to focus us, to direct us. And the result is we are growing an anemic church that, that has hijacked the moving of the Holy Spirit. We have put the Holy Spirit on the shelf and all these man-made things that are feeding our emotions but not our convictions are taking us away from what the Spirit wants. The Spirit is moving. The Spirit wants us to focus our attention on Him. You can actually say it's a false spirit. And if it's a false spirit, therefore, that will produce a false power. And we wonder, where's the power in the church? Where's the power in the church, watch this, of the living God? Because he is alive and there is power in him. So the spirit of God wants to bring life through the word of God. And that foundation comes again with our relationship with God and what the spirit of God is doing in us now, today, in 2020, moving into 2021. So my prayer is that by the time we end today and move our study to tomorrow to next Sunday talking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit that we will understand that he is so powerful that we will understand we have been walking with him through our relationship with God he has come after us prior to salvation and we are going to see again today he is co-equal co-eternal 
co-eternal, co-existent with God the Father, God the Son. And if he is that amazing, that awesome, which he is, why would we not want to give ourselves completely to the Spirit of God to show us the way, to direct us? Well, last week, again, we saw what he did prior to salvation. If you did not see that, you could go back and, and, and look at that message. But today, we are going to focus on what the Holy Spirit does in our lives after we give our heart to him. What his purpose is in the life of the believer after salvation. The first thing is this. He brings intimacy with God. The Holy Spirit is the vehicle through which you and I begin to build a relationship with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on Calvary. In fact, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now, Paul is saying that once we come to Jesus, God made us a part of his family. We are family. Listen, once we come to the knowledge of salvation and come to know Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins to witness to our hearts that we are his, that we're his kids, that we're his sons, we're his daughters. That's what he does. You know, sometimes people, and they have good intentions, and they're talking to people wondering, hey, are, are you saved? Are you not saved? Do you have Jesus Christ in your heart? And when they're in that conversation, they'll say something like this. Hey, did you say the prayer? You know, when someone's maybe doubting their salvation, wondering if God's real, wonder if, God, if, if, if he's in their heart. And that's what they say. Did you say the prayer? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I said the prayer. I asked him into my heart. Oh, you're in then. You're in. You don't have anything to worry about. But listen, that is not good for us to say because here's why. We do not validate people's salvation. I mean, that is not our job. You and I do not know who's saved and who's not as far as when they came down to an altar in a church or if they said they prayed the prayer. Um, the Spirit of God does that. And, and it is his job to validate someone's salvation. And if someone is saved, the Bible says they will have a witness in their heart, in their spirit, that the spirit of God is living in them and working through them. Are you following me? So at salvation, the spirit of God lives inside of us and he begins to tell us, hey, you're my child. You're my son. You're my daughter. He does that to encourage us to do one thing. To go to God with our problems. To go to God with all of our hearts. To seek after him. To call on him. To build that relationship with him. To know that he is there for us. I mean, if you have kids, you know when they're, when they're small and they're growing and there's an issue or they're hurt, what do they want? They want to see mom. They want to see dad. They don't necessarily get hurt and all of a sudden want to go run to a doctor. They run to mom and dad. Why? <clears throat> because inside, inside their little hearts, they know that mom and dad want to help them, want to guide them, want to protect them. And I'm suggesting in the same way, the Holy Spirit does that in our life. He bears witness that we are God's children. He draws us into that intimacy, that relationship. God has placed the Holy Spirit in our hearts to encourage us to go to him first. Didn't Jesus say this in the book of Matthew chapter six? Seek first me. Seek first my kingdom. I want that relationship with you. And we just read in the beginning of this message that Jesus said, I am bringing the Holy Spirit 
And that's why I have to go. But he is going to cause you to remember everything that I said. He is the one that is going to bring intimacy with God the Father and God the Son. So the question at this point is, why in the world would we want to go any place else? Why? I mean, some of us are dealing with serious situations dysfunctions that boggle the mind. Why would we want to bypass the Holy Spirit? Why would we not want all that he does? In fact, in Psalm chapter 18 and verse one, it says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The, 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 the psalmist knew there was a limit to what man could do. That man couldn't do everything. Why does the psalmist trust in God? How does he know to do that? Because the spirit of God moves him, that's, that's why. The Spirit of God moves him to do this. Look at it in Psalm 9, 9. It says, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. He says in Psalm 7, 1, O Lord my God, if you, in you I do take refuge, save me from all my pursuers, deliver me. He says in Psalm 11, 1, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your own mountain? He says again in Psalm 25, 20, oh, guard my soul, deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. I mean, this is, this is powerful. He's crying out to the Lord. In Psalm 16, he says, keep me safe. In Psalm 20, 20, he says, guard my life, rescue me. I do not want to be put to shame. David is in need and he cries out to the Lord. He says, I need you. I need you to hear me. Listen, and it's the Holy Spirit who produces that kind of confidence. We just saw that in the book of Romans. The Holy Spirit produces that. He draws us to the Father. He reminds us everything of God of who he is and what the Father can do. So the Holy Spirit produces that kind of confidence. The Holy Spirit draws us to God. That is part of his work. It's amazing. It's amazing. And the Holy Spirit, that secondly, illuminates scripture to us. He takes the word of God and makes it come alive. In fact, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20 says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. He says, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one denies the Father and the Son. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Watch this. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. That is powerful. Now that word for anointing is chrisma and it means ointment. You, you rub it on you and it is what happens when you rub that, that ointment on you. It's absorbed into your skin. So what, the, what John is saying here in the same way that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is like ointment. He is absorbed into our body. He begins to permeate our entire being and a part of what he does as he is 
working in us. He begins to teach us. He begins to open the word of God to us. He begins to bring truth to us. And so this is very important. And when, when John says, listen, don't be deceived by these teachings. It already is in you. It doesn't mean that I or your, as a pastor don't need to shepherd you. It means if all you're getting is listening to me and you're not going in prayer and studying, then what it is saying is if all you hear on Sunday is me, then you are in trouble. You're starving. You need to continue and I need to continue to seek after God and, and go to him in prayer. Continue to read the word of God. And the word of God is going to be illuminated to us by the spirit of the Lord. And the Lord will begin to teach us. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, it says, no one of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor heart has imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us, watch this, through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Again, this is showing us that the spiritual realities in life are greater than the physical realities of life. And verse 14 says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. These are these are men and women who have not given their heart to the Lord. But once we give our heart to the Lord, that salvation says the Spirit of God's working in us to bring forth truth from the Word of God. And it goes on to say, if we don't have the Spirit in us, that we are not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So Paul is saying that it is impossible for a person apart from God to understand all that God has for him. And the Holy Spirit comes to explain to us what God has for us, to open our minds to this truth. And it's so important that we get this. If, if he is not only the one who authors scripture, but he enables you and I then to understand it. And there may come times in our, our reading or our studying of the world when we don't understand something. And certainly we need to follow good sound principles for biblical interpretation. We need to ask the right questions. But if we come to a place and we say we really don't grasp it and we cry out, we pray, we say, Holy Spirit, can you show me? Can you help me? Can you teach me? What the Bible is saying is, yes, he will. In fact, in John 16, 13, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. That's what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 6, 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that you have said. So scripture comes alive to us because the Holy Spirit is guiding us. You know, some of you may not know that my mom and dad were missionaries to Alaska. And before my dad gave his heart to the Lord, you know, the Holy Spirit was working on him. 
my me mom and, and Poppy were, were believers and Christians, but my dad was running away from the Lord. He heard the gospel over and over again, but continued to reject it. And, and he was in, in the gangs in, in New York, and there was a time in his life when he was stealing, he was robbing, he was a thief, and he was robbing in the upstate New York, and, and the police were, were after them. They, they shot him five times in the leg, and he almost lost his leg. He almost had to have it amputated, but God rescued him there. And, you know, you thought or you would think that he would turn his life to Jesus right there, but he didn't. He actually got more stern because the people in his gang thought, you know what? Look at Pat Donatio. Donatio. He's like a god. I mean, he not only didn't get caught by the police in this. He, he, he's walking and he didn't lose his leg and he was shot. And he almost became a hero in the gang world. And, you know, my dad wrote a book, Touch Me If You Dare, about his life. And I want to, to just read a portion of this because it shows us how the word of God can really change us because the Holy Spirit brings it to our attention. And this is the time after he was shot, he's healing. He comes to my great aunt's house. Her name was Aunt Margaret, but my dad called her Honey Girl in here. They were not very... Um, set apart when it came to age. So I think my dad, my aunt was maybe, great aunt was like five years or six years, somewhere in there older than my dad. But I wanna, I wanna read you this interaction. And this is just gonna show us how, how powerful the Holy Spirit is. Let me, let me read this to you. Something drew me to her house. Just a block from ours, nearly every day I regained my strength. I was still on crutches. I found myself hobbling down the snowy sidewalk to Honey Girls, wondering why in the world I was going there, yet I went ahead. Many mornings she saw me coming and stood at her door, watching and waiting for my approach. Well, Patrick, she called out in her thick Italian accent, you're here again, aren't you? Come in, I'll fix you something warm to drink. She always shooed her two children into the bedroom or backyard to play and then fired up in, on the burner some hot chocolate. I'll just take a beer, I often muttered, flopping into her kitchen chair and banging my crutches against the wall. In my house, you'll drink hot chocolate, she <laughs> retorted. You've got to find the Lord, Patrick. She went about her work. We talked for long hours day after day about everything, not just religion, but at every opportunity, whenever I happened to open that conversational door, she stepped in with a pitchfork, making Jesus my Lord. Things would be so different, she said one day, if you just give God a chance in your life. I didn't come here to talk religion, I replied, so just drop it. All right, we won't talk about it today, she replied. Good. We sat at the kitchen table and watched the snowflakes melt as they hit the window, but my insides were far from silent. I was raging and fighting to subdue the anger and fighting the very fight itself all at once. What has the Lord really done for me anyway, I blurted. Patrick, she replied, her eyes wide open with surprise. How can you say that? He spared you again and again. The memories of that infuriated me. Oh, I don't want to hear about it, I said angrily. The thought of it just made me want to fight dirty. Anyway, I added hatefully, you haven't exactly been Miss Puritan yourself, you know. That's right, Patrick. Honey girl replied, staring squarely into my eyes. But I didn't know the Lord then. Things have changed, and things can change for you too. She, she touched my arm, and, and I jerked it back not too far away. I was losing ground. I was angry. She, she, she said, okay, Pat, I'll be quiet. I won't mention it anymore. Good, I spat. I don't care anyways. Yet I was screaming at myself, why do I care so much? 
She, she stood up and began washing her breakfast dishes. The room felt silent, except for the water and the sound of the clickling porcelain. Occasionally, she sighed. But, but my insides were crying out for help. I, I wrestled with the urges, but they were stronger than I was. I knew I needed what she had, but I was clinging to my old self only because it had been mine for so long. A question finally escaped. Aunt Margaret, did, did Jesus really die for us all? It, it, was, it was one of those absurd, cliche questions that I heard on S Sunday morning as my Sunday school teachers asked it a thousand times. I was furious with myself at that moment, but I uttered it. It was done. It was out there. She smiled and turned towards me. I thought you didn't want to hear about God, she said warmly. No, I shot back. You're right. I don't want to hear I don't want to hear about it. It makes me sick. I was boiling over inside, unable to check the torrent of anger. You tell me that God talks to you, but that's a lot of baloney. I don't believe that he talks to you. <clears throat> I think that he's a lot of baloney as well. Then, in a final explanation of frustration, I, and there's a swear word here, so I'm going to just go beep, swear, swear word. Watch your language in this house, honey girl responded, not missing a beat. God talks to me sometimes when I pray and when I read the Bible. I grab my crutches from the floor and push myself toward her bedroom just off the kitchen. Yeah, that's a lot of guff, I shouted, grabbing her Bible. I looked heavenward and shouted, okay, Lord, start talking. I flipped the Bible open at random and looked down at the open page. My eyes fell on Psalm 50. And just for the ridicule, I began to read the words. Seeing thou hast and hates instruction and casts my word behind thee. Verse 17 of Psalm 50. A chill fell over me. I shivered as I kept reading from her old King James Bible. When thou sawest a thief, then thou con contested with him and has been partaken with adulterers. My breath caught in the back of my throat. I knew I was reading about myself. I knew God had called my bluff. He was actually speaking to me from his word. Thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue to deceit. It was me staring back at me from every page, every word, every detail. It completely exposed myself to truth. Thou sittest and speaketh against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. I blinked hard and kept reading. These things hast thou done. And I kept silent. Though I was altogether such one to myself. But I will reprove thee. I will set them in order before your eyes. I shuddered with the realization of what was happening to me. It was as if the Lord were speaking each word exclusively, deliberately, purposefully to me. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you into pieces and there shall be none to deliver you. In that moment, in the depths of my inner self, the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me by name, Patrick, if you forsake me this time, you will not be delivered. You will be destroyed. I could not stop the tears. They gushed from my eyes. I grabbed my crutches and coat and looked down at the floor so honey girl couldn't see my face and I stormed out of the house. Where are you going? She called after me. Home, I shouted, gulping to keep from sounding tearful. I pulled my coat collar and leaned into the wintry wind. The tears froze on my face as I hobbled home, trembling with fear. I pushed out the words with each lurch of the crutches. Please forgive me, Lord. Please forgive me. Please. Again and again. 
I sat alone in my room trying to settle myself. The consequences of such a decision loomed before me like a black cape. But you know what, church? I'm so sorry. But every time I read that, my heart just breaks because you know what? My dad did say yes to the Holy Spirit. And it's because he said yes that I'm I'm here today. My family is where they are at today. And and God illuminated scripture to him. And God can illuminate scripture to you. And you know what? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that does that in our lives. And because of the Holy Spirit, because he brings the word of God to life, he not only saves us, but once we're saved and we continue to read the word, he does exactly what he did to my father. He shows it because he wants to bring us from glory to glory to glory. Well, the third thing I want you to see is the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ to us. He shows us who Jesus is. He shows us what Jesus is like. He shows us his glory, his majesty, his awe. Why? So we can focus on Christ and truly know Christ. That's the ministry of the Spirit. You say, Dale, how does he do that? Well, in John 15, 26, it says, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And then in John 16, 13, it says, when the Spirit of truth comes, watch this, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is going to show us the beauty and the majesty of Christ. You say, Dale, well, what's the big deal? I mean, why are you getting excited about that? What is the purpose of that? Well, this causes us to submit everything to him. He shows us his purity. Why? So we can follow that pattern in our life. The Holy Spirit glorifies Christ for the sake of authority and for the sake of example so that we can see Christ and obey him and be like him. I mean, that's critical in this day and age. I mean, God knows that if we can't get a true picture of Jesus, it will, it will change us. If we can get a true picture of who he is, it will transform our lives. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah was struggling, with resentment. He's struggling with bitterness. He's preaching the gospel. He sees nothing changing in the nation of Israel. And all of a sudden, he is opened up to Jesus Christ. And his eyes are open and he begins to see where he needs to change. He begins to see the wickedness in his heart, the bitterness, the unforgiveness. And what does he do? He cries out and he says, I am undone. Here I am accusing other people, pointing the finger at other people, but it's me I need to take care of. And Jesus Christ shows himself to him. And all of a sudden, Isaiah is changed. We see again in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and, and, and verse 12, he, it says, since we have such hope, we are very bold. We have hope in who? In Jesus. We see Jesus and we gain this boldness. In verse 13, it says, and we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, watch us, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. How does that happen? How do we get stronger? How do we get more wisdom? How, how do we see Jesus? Look at it. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 
It's the Spirit of God who does this. There's a fourth thing I want you to see. The Holy Spirit guides believers, guides us into God's will. The Holy Spirit shows us the will of God. So if we need to know God's will, we want his direction, we want him to light that path for us, we need wisdom, we need understanding. We have to realize that God's will is not a mystery. And it's the Holy Spirit that guides us into that truth. In fact, in Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I mean, this is so important. Now that's an incredible statement that we just read in Ezekiel. Did, did you realize it's the Holy Spirit who led them? It's the Holy Spirit who guided them. And some of you here this morning may be worried about being filled with the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You don't even want to listen to the message next week, maybe because of that. But I want you to understand if you today know God and, and you believe in God, he has been walking with you. He has already been leading you. It's not like you're getting somebody different working in your life when we talk about the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says that when we give our life to Jesus, when we accept him as our Savior, we have looked at this last week and then again this week, the Holy Spirit lives in us. So the Holy Spirit was there in our life prior to salvation, guiding us to salvation, guiding us to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, then we see He now is working in us at salvation. And He has something more for us. But I want you to, I want you to notice that He is leading us in this direction. Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 it says and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia having been forbidden watch this by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia and when they had come up to Mysia they attempted to go into Bithynia watch this but the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do that you go to Acts 13 and verse 2. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, did you get that? The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So listen, some of us today are needing guidance in our life and we are looking everywhere. And I'm not saying you shouldn't seek godly advice because we should do that. The Bible tells us that. But seek the Spirit of God first. That's what we just read. Because this can be so true as well. We can get two different people who may tell you two different things. The question, for example, if you're buying a house, you say, should I sell my house or shouldn't I? And if, if that godly person is a realtor, they may say sell it. And if that godly person is a banker, they may say, don't sell it. But I, I think it's obvious when we are talking scriptural truth, we can get God's will from his word. We get God's will from his word. We seek God first and then the Holy Spirit illuminates that truth of the word of God in our hearts, gives us a peace that passes our own understanding and gives us a confidence to know who we are in Christ. But, but some of us are facing decisions and it's not neatly laid out in the Bible, if you know what I'm saying. And you're going here, you're going there for direction. I want to give you some comfort to let you know the Holy Spirit will lead you. If you're here and you say, Dale, I have not given my life to Jesus, but I feel right now something is pulling me, something is happening in my heart. I'm, I'm softening, if you will. I'm realizing that I need Him. Do you know what? 
That's the Holy Spirit doing that. And, and this morning, if you have not given your life to Jesus, I want you to, to, to text this number and, and you're, there, there'll be people there that will talk to you or help you, but it's, it's, it's really easy. And this is what you need to do. Just say, you know what, God, can you, can you come into my heart? I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose again for me. I'm so tired. I can't do this life on my own. Can you come into my heart and begin that transformation? Begin that change in my life. I am ready. I want to be committed to you. I want to seek you first. The Bible says our sins are forgiven as far as the east is from the west. You are new. In fact, the Bible says you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I welcome you to the family of God. We want to pray for you for anything. Maybe you need a healing touch in your body. Maybe there is a decision that you're trying to make. We want to come alongside of you and help you. Listen, we don't need to fear anything about the Holy Spirit because we don't need to fear anything about God. Next week, we are going to take a look at the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I would love for you to join us. God bless you. I love you with all my heart. Have a great week. God bless. Guys, wow. I mean, mm. that story that Pastor Dale read you from his dad's book uh, just touched my heart so much and if you are running from the holy spirit if you have questions about jesus or about god we're just going to invite you to please again text us at the number below because we want to help you transition into a relationship with god and if an ex-gang member who is stolen thief it doesn't matter what you've done mm. or where you've been Amen. the holy spirit is pursuing you right now so i just mm. encourage you please reach out to someone anyone we're here we're available for you if you need that but mm. it's so powerful Ange. absolutely you know and he was my father-in-law. I knew him and and I know for a fact that that was the turning point for him. And you know, he never wanted to talk about his story much with us. It wasn't even until his own children were grown that he sat them down and I think he was ashamed of his past. I think he was he never wanted to glorify it, but there's so much power when you realize it's not it's not his rebellion that he's glorifying, it's the Holy Spirit Amen. that he's glorifying in that moment to say, and I think sometimes, like you were saying to you, we can feel unworthy of God's um, pursuit of us. And for you just to know that, as Tawan's saying that, like, God has such amazing plans. Who would have thought in that moment he would go on to be a missionary? Right. Thousands upon thousands of people who ha who called Jesus Lord because of what he chose to do and he just simply gave God his yes. That's it. So you can trust the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. You can just invite him in. So thank you for worshiping with us mm -hmm. this morning. We are so honored and glad that you joined us and I just pray you are blessed by every piece of our our worship time together. We want you to join us Wednesday night for the Word at 7 p.m. And be sure to share this, this service with someone that you know, especially if they're running, this is their moment. Yes, this could be their moment. Anything That's else, good. T, you want them no, to know? No, no, hey, stop running. Hmm. Stop running, that's what we're gonna leave you with. So we love you, church. We'll see you next week.